Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, hey everybody, welcome to Super Agents Live. Today, oh man, gosh, geez, I'm releasing this episode and it's late. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I've been super, super busy. Hey, so um, today's show, well, well, first of all, hey, if you have just found the show, welcome. I'm super happy and uh, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. I certainly uh, strive to create awesome, awesome content. Uh, and if you don't know what the show is about, what we do here is uh, we talk with the most influential voices in real estate, top producing coaches or, or agents, rather, uh, top coaches and authors. So today's episode, I have a guy uh, that I think a lot of you are going to relate with. He's a younger guy. His name, by the way, is Adam Hergen author. And this guy, Adam. He's a rock star, man. He is a rock star. This is a guy who sets out goals, giant goals, and, and, and motors them down. I mean, you know, look, we talked about how last year he did $58 million in volume. This year, he's on track for $98 million. We talk about how he leverages his time, his money, and his energy. And his story is pretty interesting. He's, he went from flipping cars, learning leverage, to flipping condos, and again, now. He is playing in the hundred million dollar point. And guess what? The guy is super young. He's like 32. So uh, I hope you love it. Before we get there, always a little housekeeping. Uh, the hashtag for the show, unpack that idea, tweet it out, use that hashtag, big, big follow train. Um, and look, you know, a lot of you guys just listen to the show on uh, Stitcher or iTunes. That's great. If you haven't left a, re- a review, I would love if you did it. Uh, We're slipping in our rankings, man. We were on Stitcher Radio. We were, for a long time, we were like number 52, number 59 in the world for business. Uh, And as soon as I changed the the uh, summer to the summer schedule and went from Tuesday, Thursday instead of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, all of a sudden iTunes and Stitcher said, whoop, there's a problem. And we really fell off our ranking uh, only because of the way their crazy algorithm. So it would really help the show help me if you went and uh, left a review on Stitcher or iTunes. And if you don't know how to do that, um, just go to the show, the website, superagentslive.com. And I have buttons right there. You can just subscribe on iTunes, subscribe on Stitcher. Okay, that's it. Hey, let's get to the show. Today on the show, I'm super excited. We have a guy that has big goals. He does a lot of stuff, but in real estate. In 2012, he did $58 million in transactions. In 2013, he almost doubled it to 98 million. We're gonna find out how this guy shoots through the moon and makes giant strides every year. I am thrilled to welcome Adam Hergenrother. Hey, Adam, thanks for taking the time out today. Thank you, I'm very excited to be on the show. Look, I know you have a ton of stuff going on. Um, take a minute, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and, and tell, us about, uh, tell us about you. Absolutely, well, you know, it's, it's a really interesting story. I love sharing this, the condensed version of it here. In college, when I when I first, when I got back in the, when I got into college, I bought my first investment property from selling used cars from my buddy. And this is actually a really interesting story. I had um, about five hundred dollars to my name, and my buddy and I, who was actually going to college, but slash living on my dorm room couch. If you we all know, we had both type of people in college, and his, his dad owned a used car dealership. So we ended up putting our money together, and we came up with thousand dollars. We bought a car, and he went and and bought it, sold it, and we made like 1300 bucks in total. So we made $300. But I just made $150 from not doing anything. And the reason I bring this story up, because it was really the moment that sparked my life into what leverage really meant. And there's this huge light bulb that went off, and I was like, wow, I just made $150 from not doing anything but just giving my money out. 
And so ever since that moment, I've always had the mindset of how can I leverage my time, my money, and my energy to make sure that I'm maximizing not only my goals, but the people's goals that are around me. So that's kind of been that ethos, if you will, since I was doing that. So the story be told, we built up enough money through selling cars that I bought my first real estate condo um, in 2003. It was a pre-sale unit. And in 2003, you know, the market was kind of really going up. And, and then um, I actually ended up selling it when I graduated college in 2005 because the bank called my note because I was classifying that I was living there, but the utilities were in somebody else's name. So we were forced to sell it, but we all know what happened after 2005. See, I was, I was actually quite upset in the beginning that I had to sell this because the, the prices were going up and up and up. We paid like 160 for this condo, and, um, and we ended up selling it for $219,000 in 2005. And that's just when I graduated. So you imagine graduating, and then you make like $40,000 dollars your on your I had a 50 50 partner on that on your side that's a lot of money to get out there I'm like no wonder why everyone's in real estate right right <laughs> and so the reality was we just got really lucky with the timing on that so then I ended up becoming right out of school I became a commercial underwriter and I started underwriting all these deals and about six months into the job I'm looking around feeling depressed making thirty two thousand five hundred dollars a year and I really started looking around and being like wow these guys just don't get it do they I'm looking at underwriting all these deals where people make it 150 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand, 500 grand, and I'm and I'm looking. These people have been in for 10 years and they're making 40 or 45 grand, and they're living this life. They're stretching out their day just to make sure they hit their nine hours. And I'm like, this is not my life. This is not how I want to live. So I ended up leaving that job and and uh, I worked as a financial controller for a few months. And again, that same thing happened, and I ended up jumping into real estate. And I got into real estate in 2007, which was probably the worst time to enter into real estate if, uh, if you're going to be a real estate agent. I borrowed, I borrowed $8,000 to start my first business. And people asked me what the first thing that I did was, I wrote out a check for $3,000 to travel to Howard Britton. And it was in it was the 2007, I think it was in uh, um, either Arizona or Florida, I forget which one it was. But I went there, and it was literally the first three weeks that I was in real estate, I went to this conference. And I was there, the first hour that I was there, it was one of those things, I was like, I could go home and let's just go blow this thing up. And so... You know, we were there. We got an education. We my, is my, actually my girlfriend at the time went with me. She's now my wife. Um, we got all the stuff. We came back and we put it all in the place, and we just started, you know, getting the transactions. My first year, I did 33 transactions in like seven months or something like that in a down market where everybody around me in 2007 said, "Don't leave your job. You're making, you know, this time I was making 40 grand as a financial controller. Like you're making good money. You're here. You're safe. Mortgage banks are falling out. Agents are getting out of this business. Don't do." It, you know, it really just fueled this fire inside me that I, that I just this negativity that's around me that you know you can if you use this fuel that everybody's throwing on this fire it's your energy to be able to go out there and if you can surround yourself by more intelligent individuals anything is possible in this world and so I set out to do this and, and so then we got on this roll and we started building this you know we, the first. 90 days I was in there, I realized that, hey, like, I don't want to do this stuff. I, I just don't. I'm heroin lazy. I just don't want to be doing all these things. So I hired a buyer agent kind of out of just just because I didn't want to do this. And um, we learned a lot, and I hired an EA, and I ended up going to, like, six or seven different EAs in the first, like, year of just trying to hire out of, out of um, desperation. But uh, it was a really great experience for me to go through there because, one, it taught me the first thing about making sure that the number one thing that anybody wants to do in your life is what you want to do. It's all going to come down to your mental attitude, 90% mental, 10% mechanics. And education, self-mastery is going to be your most important thing that you do for building your business and for building you. And going to that conference the first three weeks has sparked – you know, the, the ability in my mind to make sure that I'm always investing into my future and investing into my people. I mean, I spend well over six figures a year on my training and training for the people that are in all my organizations right now because of how crucial that is. So then kind of fast forward, we got into teams. Um, you know, I, I started building a team at Remax, and two years into it, I just said, okay, what's next? You know, I see this, I see this brokerage. What's going on with this brokerage? So I started looking at buying Remax that was here. And we finally, over like 90, 120 days, just finally agreed to disagree on pricing and terms. It just didn't make financial sense, even though I just wa I wanted to own it because I wanted the next step. I wanted that growth phase. 
And once I realized that we weren't going to come to terms in that, I started looking around for other companies, and there was no Keller Williams in um, in KW in Vermont. And I mean, I really enjoyed being at Remax; it was a great company, and, and I just wanted to own my own brokerage. So we started looking at KW, and then when I went down there, I met a few people, and I I, met, I actually got a chance to meet Gary, and I said, "This is the company that I want to build." And so we set out, and then we had the fastest turnaround launch um, in New England's history. Again, we had no place to incubate. If you're familiar with the KW system, I had to go out and start an independent company in Vermont because there wasn't any. It was just a, it was a crazy 60 days, but we got through it um, just through. You know, there was a night when I left. There was, a, there was that night that I left, and I left with four people from my company to start an independent and I said, it was lying in bed like two in the morning going like, what the hell did I just do? But it was one of those moments like, okay, you've done it. Boom, let's go. Let's, you've got to force yourself to fly. And it was just hitting the ground running and full of energy. That's your Jerry, hold on. That's that, your Jerry Maguire moment right there. Yeah, it was. I was <laughs> you took the fish. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you, once you jump out of the plane, though, you're forced to fly. Yeah. And, and so you learn how to do it and adapt. Anybody can. You're, you know, I call it the 20X factor. You're always 20 times more capable of anything that you think you are. Yeah. And so, you know, and there's some of those times you just have to embrace the suck, which I always love as a, as a saying is, you know, something comes up you don't like, just embrace it just deal straight on with it and move forward. And that's kind of how we, we tack that. And now, you know, four years later, we're the number one company in Vermont um, and we're, we're growing. And then, you know, part of that business building of building a market center gave me the principles that I needed to start expanding um, my real estate team, which we can get into in a few minutes here about how we, how we started expanding that. Because in Vermont, where I live, there is like 1,100 transactions the entire year. Hmm. So 1,500 transactions maybe in a good year. So we started looking at it. I said, well, I was running numbers, and my financial goals didn't match up for me staying in Vermont. So I was forced to start looking into how to expand my real estate brokerage sales uh, ability outside of Vermont. And so you know, I, I worked pretty heavily um, for about three years now, three and a half years with Gary Keller on how to start expanding, and we launched – in Portland, Maine from Vermont. It was about a six hour drive and we launched our first one in there. And I, I took I hired an individual there who was doing about five million dollars. His next next twelve months he did eighteen million. He did thirty million the next year and now we're on pace for somewhere around forty five million this year from that team. Um, and it's a great relationship when we grow. Now, you know, we're in five other states and we're we're expanding continually with our leadership team and everything that we're doing. So that's kinda how we started that expansion model and we've also taken the same business principles to bring it over to I own a capital firm Hergen Rother Capital um, BlackRock Construction US uh, dot com which we're in New Hampshire and Maryland right now developing and working with dementia specific facilities and other large projects so you know it's the same it's whatever you want to do in life is always going to come down to certain principles that you have and it's you know that whole attitude of no limits no regrets and everything's in your mindset first and really working on that self mastery to really evolve to where you want to be in life Unbel- Adam that look man I love it when I have guys like you in the show or people like you know guys but guys gals whatever and you come on and you actually tell a story man I was enthralled in that story and and really so you you started with something you wrapped it up with the same thing one thing you said, Adam, you said that everything in life is 90% mental and 10% mechanics, right? You said that earlier and then you yep. wrapped it up with that. Now, you've taken that ethos, right, that, that concept, that mm-hmm. vision, and you've, you've, you killed it in Vermont to where you couldn't grow anymore. Then you moved to Maine, and then you're going out into different, different industries, but related industries. Now, I want to get there. Before we get there, I want to go all the way back. I want to talk about how you, you found leverage. You, you, you threw some money at a car. You made some money and, you, and you, you had an idea like, hold on a second, I can make money without working, but just, just doing some smart investing. And then you did it with a condo. Um, talk to us a little bit about your, you know, how do you, your mindset, right, around leverage? I mean, was that something inherent in you or is that something you honestly just discovered when you, when you bought and sold that car? You know, it's a great question, and I'm I'm often asked that, and then I ask myself that same question because leverage just really did come natural to me to a certain extent. Now, let me preface that with throughout my life, there's something that I wanted. I always figured out how to way to get it. Mm. I just always did, and a lot of times that was through what? Through other people. 
And so from an early age when I just wanted to set my mind to go after and do something, I did it. And a lot of times I couldn't necessarily be the one to do it. And so I always went and found other people to do it for me. Hmm. And so it just started becoming part of my life. And so when I, when, then when I got to college and I invested in that car, it was like the connections of the neurons fired together. And it was like, boom, it was that moment that said, okay, look, there's a way to do this so you don't have to be the one doing it. See, I think the problem when people want to go out and they start another line of business um, within their, within, even in their real estate team, if they want to go farm now or whatever it is, I always look and before I start that division, I go out and find the person for it to do it. Because most people do it the backwards and they go out and they take it on and then they try to find somebody. By that time, they're too busy to go out and find the right person for it. Right. So my whole ethos is, look, like if I'm going to start something, I'm going to go find the person for it. They're going to do it for me. And here's the other kicker to that. If you go out there and do that and it starts becoming successful, you are now start to become relying on a certain amount of income from that. Now you start replacing that with a salary. It feels like a takeaway, and people don't want to do that. Right. And so if you go out there first and invest 70 grand into 100 grand, to a person who now is giving you 50 grand in the first six months from there, now you learn to live off that 50 grand instead of that 130,000 or 150 grand that you'd be making from that line. But the difference is I would people allow you to buy time. And time is by far the most precious for me, come on, the most precious it's not a commodity at all. I mean, the most precious thing in this world. And you know, people always are like, well how do you deal with all these things? And the reality is, is I actually have a pretty good life. I mean, the first four years of my of building real estate, I was, you know, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, whatever it took, I was doing it. I mean, we started off in a 400-square-foot apartment, me and my, my girlfriend in this crazy town and this place, crazy area in, in Burlington that was um, run down. Somebody got shot in our block from us. I'm not kidding. Like, that's where you started prospecting. That's where you were. And um, and so, you know, we came from, we were in those in that area, and then we just started building and building and building and and it was all about investing in the people and their time. And when you did that, you just started to see and experience what happens when you get the right people on your bus and let it grow. And it was just that kind of really triggered the whole leverage piece into me. I think the biggest fear people have on leverage is their income ability of that. They think if they, well, you know, if they want to go and say, okay, I want to go hire a buyer agent, but if I just do this, A, it's just easier, and the reality is I'm going to make more money. Well, that's the wrong way to think about that because you're always tied to a specific job now that's going to be able to produce a certain level of income. And some people may be super happy with that in terms of, you know, I'm fine with making that amount of money and working these hours. But at some point, let me tell you, you won't be. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to make that transition, you're not going to be able to because you created such a habit loop that has tied you into not being able to leverage. And so when you go out and hire, if you, and a lot of people, they hire the wrong buyer agent. And then what happens is you go through 90 days and they screw up a deal and they do this. And then all of a sudden, you know what they say to themselves? They say, you know what? It's just easier for me to do it. And they go right back to where they were before. Yeah. And then they say to everybody, well, it just doesn't work for me. Teams don't work. I don't get it. This thing doesn't work. So now they've created this. And so now... If you just go out there and say, look, I know that it works. I mean, how, I mean you talk to amazing agents all the time who, are, who have amazing businesses, not real estate teams, businesses that are being run by individuals. So they just need to know that and model that. And you talk to them, they've gone through a lot of trial and error and failure. But they also read. They also talk to people. They listen to your show. They, they, do, they surround themselves with individuals who have gone through it so they can learn faster. And I think wisdom is listening to somebody that's been there already and literally putting it to place in your life. And you do that, then you start getting on this role, and then you get one key person in your life to give you that not intellectually constructing of what it thinks about in your mind, but actually feeling it in your nervous system. And when you feel in your nervous system, you've expanded your consciousness in your mind and you will never be able to go back from that. God, That's I, how you build a business. I love it, man. I mean, you, there's tons of gold in that. And first of all, right. So you said wisdom is listening to somebody who's done it and modeling that. Now I want to point out, like if, if people missed it, I'm is, you're a young guy. You graduated in 2005. Um, how old are you, Adam? 32. 32 years old. 32 years old and killing it. Now, one thing you said over and over again, I want to go back. When you, you were talking about, you said you don't do it yourself. You're really good at finding somebody who can do it for you, which I love that. And, and you talked about some of the pitfalls. 
what you said when you said you said invest in someone else and and over and over you said invest now one thing you did early on that is counterintuitive to a lot of people you borrowed eight thousand dollars you took three grand and you invested yeah. in yourself right you went to that howard yeah. Brinton thing and literally i think yeah. you said like within the first couple hours you were ready to set the world on fire and now yeah. again people like if they have if they borrow eight thousand dollars like they're they, they most people have an, a scarcity mindset they're like i'm not going to spend that on that i don't know if i'm going to get something out of it how did you again is this an innate thing how did you go like is it a leap of faith why did you go and spend three thousand dollars why did you invest that borrowed money into yourself well, it goes back to what you just kind of highlighted that I've been saying is I talked to somebody else and I talked to somebody that was doing this at a much higher level and I said, look, I have eight grand. What should I do? And they said, go to a conference. And I didn't think about it. I just did it because it was somebody that I knew was getting the result. They had the life that I lived and they were saying it's all about investing into yourself. Hmm. And that was foreign to me at that point. But I didn't, I'm like, look, I'm like, this guy's done it. Why would I need to try and reinvent this wheel? I'm just going to model after what he's done. And then that's all I did, and literally, because I had barely been in real estate, it was three weeks when we flew out there, and uh, wow. I mean, the first hour I could have left and been awesome for that whole, like, I just remember it was just, it was such a cool experience, and I, when I so when I coach agents for my market center for things, I'm like, oh, go to family reunion, or go to this conference, and they're like, but, you know, I don't have the money, I'm like, okay. First of all, with that mindset, you're certainly not going to, and I'm like, well, what about this new car you just bought? Right. You know? And it's like, they, they, they use the. They think they need things to give them actual dollars, but the reality is, is they need to invest in themselves, and the things will come later on. Which, by the way, those things don't even matter. Um, you need material thing. You need to invest into yourself first, and when you do that, you are now have these leadership ability to go out there and grow. That's why if you talk to billionaires or millionaires that have done it at a high level, they say, look, I could fail. I could just go build it back. All I need is some time. Right. It's because they've learned that lesson of what it's like to manage a financial tool called money and not allow it manage you and to be able to push yourself through the endurance factor of, of having that emotional fitness, right, of staying mentally tough, that grit, that word that's being thrown around now, of being able to get through that stuff, and knowing that if you give it your all and you always stay in control and push yourself forward, you will succeed. Yeah, so look, so let me ask you this. So you found leverage when you bought the car, and then you bought a house, and you got lucky. I mean, and, you know, you, you know, I talked to lots and lots of successful people, and, you know, it's not always about about your talent, right? It, there's, a, there's, there's timing, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, tech technology marketplace. There's something called product market fit, and it's all about timing. Now, so you got lucky, and they made you sell that house. Why in the world you bought that condo, you made 40 grand on it, why did you go then get a job? I had a similar experience, by the way, but why did you go into the corporate world and make and, and work eight hours a day for 32 grand in salary? Your first job. Well, the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, in hindsight, I probably, you know, I don't know if I would have changed anything because I needed that experience in my life to ascertain exactly what I wanted to do. But here's the thing. You know, I see a lot of people getting out of school and they don't know what to do, so they don't do anything. I didn't necessarily know what I didn't what I what I wanted to do. I just knew that I had to do something. And so that's what got me on the path. It got me to underwrite real estate deals. So I started the experience of understanding what it was like to look at it from the other side of a deal that most people never see. And so it was a really powerful experience for me. But then in there being in the time, literally, that's why, I mean, I have 140 employees in you know, multiple different states now. And, my, and our whole philosophy here is that we have unlimited paid vacation. We have no set hours. We have dog-friendly office. Everybody, everybody, whether you, you, you are a leadership with my team or you're uh, the second level down or a third level tier, I mean, whatever it is, that happens for everyone in the organization. And I go on talk shows all over in, in, in Vermont to talk about this, about how we're structuring our entire company this way. Because in, in my whole thing was when I was at that job that I was at, there were things that I wanted to do, or like I would get in the work a little early to beat the traffic, and I'd be done by 10:30, and then then I would want to take a little quick little break or or do something and or just do more. And they were like, "Well, make this make this last for the day." And I'm like, "What? <laughs> this is just not. It's like this. Is what they're like. This is what people do." And I'm like, no, this isn't what people do. This is what people do who want to make 40 grand the rest of their life and are be miserable and work at the and DMV. I'm, like, I'm not. 
exactly. And I'm like, I'm like, look, I'm not saying making forty grand and doing that is going to make you miserable. I'm just saying that you're just not living a life of fulfillment. If you don't make any, if you make ten grand, you're living life of fulfillment. That's awesome. That's more happier than most people will ever be. But the reality is, is most people don't live their their jobs. They don't they don't live for their passions of what they want to do because they allow fear to stop them. And if fear is the person that's holding you back, you're never going to experience how far you can go unless you're willing to put it all out in the line. And from the beginning, I was. I didn't care. I mean, I knew in my 20s that, you know, it's a long, it's another experience about how when I, myself growing up, I was overweight for over 100, most people know if I start this off with a presentation of a picture of me up to I was 16 years old, so I was 100 pounds overweight my entire life. Hmm. And one day I came home, I was in the drugs, I was, I was, just, I was failing class, I was just your, your terrible student, terrible person you're on. I came home one day in high school and I started crying. I cried for the entire night and I just thought to myself that this is not who I am supposed to be. This is not how my life is going to go. And that moment is when I took control of my life. And over the next year, I lost 100 pounds. I started getting, you know, I completely changed the friends that I was with and then becoming captain of my football team, yada, yada, yada. You got that whole story. But that was the turning point in my life. And then in my late, tw- my late 20s, I started becoming successful economically and I started having some experiences of, okay, I had some really nice material things but the reality was is I felt this huge void in my life and I was started on like okay well I got this $150,000 car I have a house in the lake like I started getting these things and I started treating people like I was God I was like okay whoa this is again this is not how I want my life to be and this is not how it's supposed to be and so I did this really soul searching as I did about 10 years previous to that when I was in high school and then I found more of the, the spiritual path and I realized for me that it was all about the experiences I needed to have in my life and that the world is really 200% not 100% most most people spend 100% of their time in this, what I call the relative world, which is your material things. They, they're searching for fulfillment or happiness in these things, cars, boats, planes, they get this, country clubs, whatever it is. When the reality is, is life is 200%. Life's first 100% in the absolute world, which your absolute world is your inner world. It's a world where you control. And if, if you first concentrate everything 100% in the absolute world, whatever happens in the relative world won't matter because you know that you are fulfilled inside in your absolute world. And then you can fail and succeed, whatever it is, in the relative world. And you can certainly have your nice things, but they don't matter at the end of the day. Not just intellectually telling yourself that, but actually feeling that in your nervous system, that those things could be gone and nothing would change you. And when that started happening in my life, my businesses, by the way, exploded because I no longer had any fear or any doubt or any any worry about what people thought or how I was doing it. And that's when I started really shaping and that's when things exploded for geometric growth in my organization. And, you know, KW has a really great philosophy of our training and education company. That's really what, you know, you look at the construction industry, it's been the same way forever. I'm changing that. I am right now. I mean, I'm changing how people are doing that, how the education we provide to people that are project managers and supers and admin and the leadership roles that we're taking to get people to get on this path path of self-mastery because if your, your company is constrained to the number of leaders you have in your organization. So if that's the case, then why wouldn't you put all your energy into them and growing them so much so they grow your business, not you? Again, man, first of all, Adam, I, I'm sure I'm sure if you've given presentations, I'm sure people have said, hey, when are you going to write a book? And, is, is that, and I don't want to spend time on that, but is that a, that's got to be on your roadmap, dude. It has to be. I mean, it's on the roadmap at some point. I want to get some, some more things and, you know, and stuff. So, but so it's there at some point. So going back, you know, talking about, I, I, you know, if we explore this absolute world um, and this relative world, relative. Um, yeah. you know, one thing, and I actually wrote this down. I take notes as I'm, I'm listening to you. And early on, I wrote down, I wanted to ask you, you know, you really sound like you are a guy that is, you're building your life by design, where most people mm-hmm. live their life by default. And, and again, so you, uh, when you were, when you're younger, I don't know, 16 or whatever, you're over overweight yep. you you designed your life and overweight to a football team captain right you, same thing happened when you were killing it in real estate <clears throat> like i don't even know what to ask you but you know what i'm getting like how did you yeah. come up with this absolute yeah. relative i mean how did you flesh that out again you're a young guy i mean this is you know this is like wisdom of a, of a 60 year old how did you, like 
Go. It, will come, it comes down. No, this is great. I mean, it comes down to, again, of that self-mastery. And so if you're on this journey, so, I mean, I literally spend time with as many billionaires as I can. And I know it sounds weird. These guys will open up to you, by the way. You know, I was just three weeks ago, I'm going to keep the guy's name off, off record, but I was meeting with him. He's a billionaire. He was, he, he was just spent a week with uh, Warren Buffett. Literally, the week before I saw him, and we're sitting in this restaurant in Vermont, and you mean it's just nobody would know. You guys got to drive in the 2003 Super Outback, anyways. And so we're having this conversation, and he starts telling me he's like, I was down there at this philanthropy event, and there was billionaires everywhere. And he said, you know what the really sad thing was, Adam? He said they were all miserable except for a few. He said they all had this disease and this need to be seen in life, and they couldn't accept who they were. These guys have done amazing things, companies, patents, doctor. I mean, just crazy billionaires, ultra successful, but they are miserable. And so when I got in my life and I thought that things were going to provide fulfillment to my life, I realized that was the exact opposite. And so I did this whole kind of soul searching and found paths that the reality is what's really going to give you the fulfillment is your experiences and growth in life. So now when I go out there, I set huge goals to go out there and push my team and myself further than I could ever go. Like I, you know, like three months ago, actually in June, I just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm. You know, it was one of those things that we just signed up and that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, it's, it's, and it made me train harder, maybe think differently, maybe see a third world country. Getting out there and doing these things is what it's all about. It's that whole path and self mastery. You know, when we talk about this in so much in, you know, interviews and books and stuff, and if people would understand that these are the business principles that you need in order to take your real estate team to a business, these are the things you need to do because if you really truly had no fear, if you had no fear, then you would go out there and make different decisions. If you didn't truly care about what people thought about you, whether or not you're successful or what kind of car you drive, then you would be making different decisions. And, you, and as those decisions, if you get up in a plane in New York City and you shift course 10 degrees, you're going to end up in Seattle and not Arizona. And so it's these, it's these decisions that you start off with every single moment of your life that are going to shape your destiny. You know, and so I have a really structured routine in my life now. It starts, I'm up at 5 a.m., and, you know, a lot of times you have to say no to things at night. But I'm up at 5 a.m., the first thing I do is I meditate for 20 minutes, and then I get into uh, a journaling phase where I have, I have multiple journals. I have one journal of my main life that I talk about everything. It takes about 20 minutes. Anything that's on there, good, bad, ugly, I don't care what it is, I want it out of my mind. I need to have the mental energy to be able to go forward and concentrate on things that I have. I also have a gratitude journal. And just write down things, all the things that I'm grateful for that day, and there's usually about 100. Sometimes they're the same things for a year. I don't care. I just write them all down. Whatever comes to mind, I just get in the zone, I write it out, and I use Evernote for it. Mm -hmm. Then I have a gratitude journal for my wife, and I have something that I'm grateful for her that's different every single day, and at the end of the year, I put together in that a book, and that's the 365 things that I'm grateful for for her. Ooh, and that also, cool. and sometimes that's really hard to do when you're not in the best of moods with your wife, I mean, with your partner or whoever, right? It just happens. But it forces me to think about the good things. Yeah. And I have two kids, so I also journal about both my kids' lives every day. And again, maybe a paragraph, maybe a sentence that day, but something that they did or said, so I want them to take down their life. And, by t and then I have a whole, I look at my org charts, my personal financial statement, um, I have affirmations, I've written out, I have like 12 pages of different things I have. I read all those every day. That takes me about an hour and a half. So for about an hour and 50 minutes in the day, I, from the time I wake up to do this, that's how I start my day. But when you're done that, you, it's this mental clarity that you have in your, in your mind, and it's just you're like you're ready to take on anything. And then I, and I, I'm right, right now I'm training for a Spartan Beast, so I run after that, and I'm doing two a days for workouts. But it's, you add that component onto it. It's like today, for instance, I spent um, – I, I spent – I'd also – have a foundation called the Hergenrother Foundation. So I spent time this morning working with a paraplegic on things, and then I went and I spent time with my spiritual advisor. That was pretty much my whole morning. And you know, it's it's in. I'm just, I was sitting there when I was working with my spiritual advisor today, and I'm just going, wow, I have an awesome life. Like, think about what I did today. I got to work with this guy for this nonprofit. He's awesome at what he's doing. Then I'm here listening to all these guys. You know, my spiritual advisor talk about this stuff, whereas everyone else is running around this world chasing these things. I'm creating the life that I want to live. 
And by doing this and by keeping people super focused on their goals, which we can talk about structure and how you do that, um, but keeping that allows you to live and continue your experiences, which is really ultimately going to give you that growth, right? Yeah. So, so I want to talk about something. Oh, there's, a, there's, again, every time you talk, there, there's tons of stuff that, that I want to dig into, but... So you made a, going, a little bit going back to absolute relative, right? So first you realized that, uh, you know, having that, that Ferrari or that Porsche, or that Panamera, whatever it is, that's not important. It's experiences. Now, now, but you take it one step farther because what, what now is important to you is, is enhancing your team and, uh, you know, making them better than they are. How does someone first they covet? And I think it's natural. I think it's natural for people to first covet things, the things they see, Ferrari, Porsche, big house, boat, whatever. Now, once you move away from that, how do you, how do you stop from coveting your own experiences, your own growth? Because I, I know your growth is super important to you. You climb Kilimanjaro. You have all these personal growths. How do you then move away from coveting that, that personal growth and move on to, I, I don't know if coveting is the right word, but making the growth of other people extremely important to you? Well, I think you got to, when you start, you know, following in tune with, with, and listening to your inner voice, which we all have, and, and whether or not we choose to listen to is different, you start following what your true passion is in life. And I think most of us, you know, really want to give. And we all have different talents, and we can give in different ways. Mine just happens to be in, you know, I have this kind of, this mantra, if you will, this ethos that I use. Um, either somebody comes on new or just what I'm sharing, I always say that, look, I care more about who you become than I do about being your friend. For my family, for my brother, you know, my brother's a partner in one of my businesses, um, anybody that's on my team, I care more about who you become than I do about being your friend. So hmm. I will have that conversation with you. And so I always look for an opportunity to coach or, you know, sometimes they laugh and joke that I preach on people a lot, which I do, but, but you know, at the end, sometimes they don't always want to hear it, but, you know, they, I see their growth, and I see what that does to their life, and then everybody else in life's around them, and how much, you know, and it's interesting, when you start doing this, people, you'll think like you're not getting anywhere, and then all of a sudden, somebody will run, you'll run into somebody and be like, oh my God, I didn't know that Joe is working for you, and man, that guy has changed. He is just incredible, and he, he gives it all to you, and it's the first time you've heard it. And you're like, wow, really? I didn't even think Joe cared. Right. And so it's like, you know, in goals that you hear, then you're like, wow, that, you just know that you give somebody that gift to change and push them into to either financial freedom or experiences or, or whatever mastery path they need to go on. That is fulfillment. I mean, that's, that's where you're going to take this all in and you're going to be able to, you know, cherish those moments. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I totally agree with you. And look, I mean, uh, briefly about myself, you know, I mean, I've done a bunch of companies and <clears throat> I was always, you know, I wanted to make money, right? I, I, I was like, I want to become a millionaire. I made it, I became a millionaire. Yeah. I wanted to be a multimillionaire. I became a multimillionaire. And, and then I realized my company, I started, I started seeing people with, you know, <clears throat> I'd go to their neighborhoods. I'd drop them off, whatever their car, you know, they didn't have enough gas to get to work or whatever. And I realized once I started going into those neighborhoods that the people who didn't show up or when I had problems with my employees, I didn't necessarily have an employment problem, a people problem. I had my, my employees had a dream problem. And, and that became at that point kind of a mission for me. I started helping people. I put people through drug programs. And that is so wonderfully fulfilling that, that but you have to, it's so funny. I think you have to, you know, for me, I had to experience success before I could give back. And, you yeah. know, um, I, and I'm not, it sounds like that's kind of your path as well. But let me, let me back up. You, you said something extremely impressive to me and I think to most of my audience that you kind of glossed over you're like oh last week I was meeting with this billionaire right and, and you said I think you said before you said I, I hang out with as many billionaires as I can how in the world man do you meet a billionaire number one and number two how do you get them to to, to go to coffee with you yeah it's I mean <laughs> Uh, persistence. But you know, the the funny thing is, is you know, you, you don't start out meeting billionaires, right? You, you could, if that's what you wanted to, at least I didn't, you know, it'd be awesome if you did. But I started off when, you know, I bought eight grand, I met somebody that was making $500,000 a year. And to me, that was a tremendous amount of money right then. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to them and I found out what they did. And then once I started kind of experiencing that realm, I said, okay, well, who's next? And I started meeting with somebody that's making a couple million. And then it was like 20 million. And then it was a hundred million. And when you start seeing this, right, you start getting this and you realize 
realize these people are no different than you and I, yeah. you know, they're, they're the same people. And they, and honestly, these people want to give you things. They want to give you the knowledge because they got it too. So then when I just started becoming really comfortable, you know, um, you know, being around people that, you know, are economically successful and also living the life that I want to live in terms of all the realms of this world, you know, I want to model myself to most people, you know, then I just started reaching out to people that were billionaires and I just, you know, and they don't, it's not like you have this first moment that they really said, yeah, okay, great. I'm going to meet with you. Right. But it was, you know, I added value to their life. Like this guy that I just met with, I've been emailing him since November and I sent him a card. I sent him a handwritten card. I saw him in Forbes. I wrote him a note that said, Hey, you know, I, I read your article. It's great that you're doing this philanthropy, you know, here, blah, blah, blah. And I, I didn't hear back from him, but I just kept doing it. And finally, then finally I emailed him and he said, sure, that'd be great. Let me go ahead and set up you know, with my assistant. And then boom, we we're on the calendar two weeks later. See, there you go. And by the way, it was interesting. And it was interesting too because we were supposed to be for half an hour. We sat for an hour and forty minutes. See, yeah, right, and, and look, I mean, I mean, just like you want to give back to everybody you meet, right? You kind of, you maybe overcoach people. I'm the same way, right? I see people and I want to help them. I, hey, man, I think this. If you change this about your business, you know, you, you, I think you'll take off. Um, and those people, you know, they they probably see you. You you're a uh, you're a persistent guy, and they want to give back. Now. You, earlier I said, how do you meet that? And you said, hey, I'm persistent. And I think I, I can change persistent to deliberate. And, and if I look at your life, Adam, you've been deliberate about so many things and your deliberateness, your persistence has paid off in multiple ways. <clears throat> Let's, when I look at, when I look at you, I, I want to jump into, you really are a true entrepreneur. You built your business as a business, right? You didn't just sell real estate. You built a team, mm -hmm. built it up. Bang, you go out, you start a construction company. Then you, you start, the, you, you have this uh, capital, I'm not sure what it is, but you have this capital company, and you also have this foundation. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, about some of those things and why you're doing it and what, and, and what you're getting out of it. Well, I think the, you know, the, the question that I get a lot is how do I handle all this stuff? It's a great question. I think the biggest, biggest misconception that people have for people that are, that are successful you know, in, in economic terms or build great businesses is that they work all the time. Well, the reality is, is you know, I work four days a week, Monday through Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday is off. Um, you know, I have Friday as a flex day, 90% of the time I don't work it, but there is, you know, times that I can use it to put appointments if I need to. Now, only ones that I choose. And I don't work past 5 o'clock. You know, it's very structured for them. I block out my calendar from 11.30 to 2 o'clock every day. I go to the gym, I come back and I meditate and I eat, and that's just my time again. And so I always put the things that I want to do first into my calendar, and then I let everything else fill up. So on Mondays, so here's, the, here's the really neat thing that if you want to build multiple businesses or even businesses that have a you know, large capacity to growth is you have to be very structured with your time management and your, other, and your people. So on Monday, I meet with all, all my leadership team. I do a four-in-one in cast, which is basically a 30 to 45-minute meeting once a week, which is what were your goals last week? Did you hit them? Did you not hit them? If you did, awesome. If you didn't, what are we doing this week to change it? And we have very fierce conversations. It's not like, hey, you know, let's talk about your weekend or what it is. I mean, there's a whole element that I would concentrate on their personal life, but not personal small talk. There's a difference. Hmm. There, you know, it's, it's, uh, if somebody has a personal issue, I may spend 45 minutes the entire time on their personal issue, but it's not necessarily small talk on their personal life. I want to move them. I want to find out what they're doing financially. How are they setting up their accounts? I want to know everything about, and you know, and over time, you start doing this. I know more about the people that I coach with than their partners do. And that never information never goes out, not even to my partner, not to anybody. It just always stays within me. It's, it's always I can find. That way, when I have that fierce conversation with them, they know it's because I care more about them than I do about being their friend. Mm. And so when we sit there and we have these conversations, it's, it could be, you know, if your goal was to have 10 listings last week, right? Let's just use that as an example. The conversation may go something like this. These are real-life conversations that I have. It may be... Um, Okay, you know, uh, Adam, did you, did, you go hit, did you hit your goal of 10? No, I hit two. Okay, well, what happened? And this is the key thing, guys. When somebody, people either have a story or they have a result in life. So if I ask somebody, said, hey, did you lose weight? What, if somebody had lost the weight, what do they say? Yeah, I lost 38 pounds. 
if they didn't lose weight, they say, well, you know, I didn't, and, it's, and they get into this whole story. And by the way, the story may be 100% absolutely true, but it's still a story. Right. There's two people that in this, in this world, one that gets the thing done no matter what the story is, and there's somebody that has a story. And so it's a result or a story. So then you hear this, so you say, okay, no, I had, I had two. Well, what happened? They give you the story. You say, okay, well, you know, we obviously have a standard on our team here, and, you know, two is your goal is 10 and you set that goal of 10 and so I can't allow you to not be at a number that is not getting close to your goal because if I do then I feel like I'm letting you down so what are we going to be doing differently this week to make sure that we hit your 10 listing appointments and they're going to say well you know I'm going to call some more people well that's great well how many more people are you going to call you know I'm going to try to call for you know a period of time a little bit longer okay great let's go ahead and take your calendar out right now so we can time block that time while we're sitting here together and so then they take their calendar out and say, okay, good. And we add an extra hour every single day of what we're going to do. And then this is what will happen. People will either step up or they'll step down. If you have the right person, they're going to step up from your talk. If you have the wrong person, they're going to step down because they know they can't rise to the challenge. That's how you top grade people, and that's how you move and push your entire organization forward. You know, we have a we have this, this interesting thing going on that where I don't really – I have a high standard for people in my life. And so I fired a lot of people. But the interesting thing is, is and in, in, there's an issue that came up, and one of my employees that I have got actually scared that I was going to fire her, and she's been with me for about 100 days now. Um, and so I felt a little bad, so we had to, I, I brought my entire leadership team together. I said, look, if you guys have been with me for more than 90 days, you have a very good chance that you're never going to have anything issue. And they kind of laughed because I broke it as a joke. And the reality is, in my entire life, I've only fired one person that's been with me for more than 90 days. And they all kind of like, it was kind of like a big aha for everybody because they know. And I said, look, everybody else has been fired in the first week or 30 days. And it's only because I know it wasn't the right position for them and it was my fault. And I know that I was pushing them way too hard. We go at 400 miles an hour and I know it's mostly me, not them. And if it's just not the right fit, it's just not the right fit. Let's go ahead and move on from here. But I think you, know, you, have, you have people – People, when they hire somebody and they don't hit their goals that they set out, they don't want to go back into the hiring process, so they just allow these goals to happen. And that's why if you look across the country, plus or minus agents, 10%, plus or minus year over year, their business is either grow or decline by 10%. It's, it's, it's unanimous. You look at that, except for a slept few, they plus or minus 10%. And it's only because they – don't invest in themselves or they're having the wrong people on the bus and they're not pushing them for it. And if you, by the way, if you have a very talented person and you're not pushing them, they will leave you and then you'll blame them that they were just crazy. Right. And so they really want this push and this accountability. So that's how we structure that entire Monday. My entire day is full of four and ones. Tuesday, my entire day is nothing but leadership meetings. And it's a leadership that I, I teach once a week. Um, for an hour, and then I get into my individual meetings with each company that I have. So Monday and Tuesday is my entire day of directing focus for people. And so that's I direct focus for people. Then organizationally from each team or company, we direct their focus. And then from there, people carry it out, and then we check. Then, I, then literally I'm kind of done for the week, if you will. You know, I have my appointments and stuff that I'm doing, but really they could – you know, they have their thing until next Monday and Tuesday till we meet. If I have to micromanage them, then I said the wrong person. Yeah. Well, it goes back to that, that, you know, that thing that you hear often it's, you know, hire slow and fire fast. I do the same thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so look, yeah. we have to start wrapping up in a little bit. Um, but I want to talk to you. There's so much, dude, really, Adam, I would, I wish we would have booked like a part one and part two for this because there's so <laughs> much that you have, but I want to talk about quickly peers and mentors, right? Not everybody can get there on their own. And I'm sure that you've had some mentors along the way. So, so this is kind of a two-part question. Number one, how does a very successful young guy like you find peers? Because there's very few 32-year-olds that have mm -hmm. your mindset as well as your success. And how does someone who is aspiring go out and find a good mentor to help them get to the next level? And real quick before you answer that, I just want to point out, I want to make sure everybody in the audience remembers this. You found a guy. That was doing five million. You helped him get to eighteen million, then thirty-three, and now to forty-five. That is great mentorship. So, how does somebody, if they, how does somebody find you as a mentor, or for you, how do you find peers? You know, it's uh, it's one of those when people become successful. I think there's this whole kind of 
transition that goes on with the friends that you had to the people that you that you go and you meet and I think you go through this this phasing period where when you first start to become successful people want to pull you down because they don't want to feel insignificant in that moment not even doing it consciously they're doing it subconsciously and so I think you go through that stage and once you become successful they want to be back your friend again because you have things and so I you know a lot of my friends I still have some amazing friends in Vermont but I have some amazing friends that I travel to and meet and, and, and that I meet for all these training conferences. Like the two people that I hiked Kilimanjaro with, one lives in Maryland, the other lives in D.C. I live in Vermont. I and, mean, you know, honestly, I connect with my friends that are um, throughout the entire country more often than I do with my friends that are even locally because I've met them at the same events, the same level that we're at. They're at the same level. They have multiple businesses. They're doing the same thing. So when we have these conversations, they're high-level conversations and, and for me. So it's all you may have to travel you may have to start getting on somebody told me when i was when i was kind of becoming like your friends you may have to get on a plane to go see them soon and that's always stuck with me it's like you're right because there's not a lot of people that are doing what you're doing or other people are doing or aspiring to do that are right around you now i'm sure there may be, i live in a small state so it's one thing um uh, it's harder but you know you may live in a bigger state there's more people there but it's just about getting yourself out there and getting those events because that's where you're going to meet those people Getting the so the mentor thing is an awesome question, and my answer to that is you want to find somebody that not just economically is hitting the goals that you want, but is also living the life that you want. I think that's a big distinction. Most people say, "Well, that person's making a ten million dollars a year. I want their life." Well, the reality is. is there's a lot of people that are making, there's 1,466 billionaires in the world right now, most has ever been. There's 9.2 uh, millionaires augmented net worth, meaning people not including their primary net, their residents. And there's 162,000 in the U.S. of people that, own, that are net worth of 25 million or more. There's a lot of people in that group that I would never want their life. Never. Not for the money, nothing. But there's a lot of people in there that I would want their life. And I think you have to find the mentor that makes you create that they have the life that you want. I look at it on multiple different circles, physically. I mean, I'm, I, you know, from ever since I lost 100 pounds, physical activities is by far the most important thing in my life. How am I physically doing? That's where I start off. How, how am I doing spiritually? You know, do they have a good spiritual life? How is their family life? Is their family life good? Do they have time for their family? Um, and then I look at, you know, how, what do their friends and social life look like? Are they doing adventures? And then I look at their work. And then I look at their numbers. So I look at the entire package, and I, and I purposely put money towards the end because I think if you don't have those first four or five things, then the money doesn't even matter. And so I look for people that, are, that I want to model my life after that have those things. And I may go and I may take a, a piece of Tony Robbins or uh, Oprah Winfrey or Gary Keller, or, and I may take the piece that I want from them and I find out how they're doing that piece and then I put that into my life so I become a sliver of the best things of all the people that I want to model. That's how I built my mentorship. No, I love it. I love it. So, but um... – and, and look, in a lot of ways, I can say that everybody listening to you right now, I mean, you can mentor them at some level, right? I mean, you know, uh, Tony Robbins was my mentor only because I read his books. I, you know, I've never met, I've, and I've been to his conferences, but I've never spent time with him across, you know, at a Starbucks. How, how yeah. did, once I find somebody to model, Adam, you know, and, and this is for everybody, how, how do you, you you know, I know you're persistent, but how do I get, how do I build that personal relationship where, you know, it's a, it's a two-way conversation instead of a one-way? Yeah, I think you just got to ask. Yeah, there you go. I, I, th I mean, I think it's that simple. I think you, I think people are afraid to talk to those people, and I think you just got to ask. And I think, you know, and then when you get a connection with them and you have that one meeting and you say, you know, who, well, who else do you know that I think that you think I should talk with? And they say, Joe Smith. And you say, great, could you introduce me to Joe? Right. And then before you even leave, and next thing you know you're on this train, and then you just keep building and building. And the thing is, is you may not start off with a billionaire. If you do, that's awesome. I encourage you all to do that. But you may start off with someone that's a millionaire. And then you build that confidence into it. At least this is how I did it. And then you get to the next person and the next person. And, it's just, and then it just starts snowballing, that momentum, that big mose on your side at that point. And you just start rolling with everything. And, and then it brings it down to um, you know, the people that you're surrounding yourself, you become. I mean, it's just, we all know that. It's just, you know, there's so many business principles out there that are, that are, 
that are there to take, and it does, I'm probably the least intelligent person on this call. I just model very well, and I also follow the principles of life that people have shed down with us. You know, we follow the laws of gravity all the time, right? We can't see gravity. We can't see it. We can't smell it. We can't taste it, but we certainly follow it. We don't go on a seven-story building and pretend we're not going to follow the laws of gravity, do we? We abide by those things, and if we abide by the same principles that we all know that are in our life and we just put them in into our life, that's when we'll start living our life of fulfillment and passion because we're going to see the growth and results that we want from our life. I love it, man. And look, and you know, the, there's a, everything you were saying reminded me of, of a Jim Rohn quote. I'm sure you heard it, but you know, yeah. Jim Rohn says, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So go and find a better Absolutely. group of people. <laughs> hey, Adam, thank you, man, for coming on the show and sharing the, your, your pearls of wisdom. I'd love to have you on again. And by the way, after, don't hang up after we sign off because uh, I, I think we probably know a ton of people in common. But here's, here's my last question. <clears throat> Excuse me. My last question is this. I do it for everybody. I'm going to ask for a book recommendation, and I know you're a KW guy, so I'm going to exclude. You cannot say the millionaire real estate agent. So I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? The One Thing. The One Thing. Jay Popson. Uh, Gary Keller. Gary Keller. <laughs> Again, man, uh, let us know where we can find you. I know that I, I'm sure, look, going back to mentorship, I'm sure that if anybody is in Portland, Maine or, uh, or in Vermont near you, you're always looking for talent. I'm sure you have a very high bar, but Absolutely. I would encourage people, if, you're, if you want to level up, go meet Adam, see if he'll take you on. But other than that, you know, if people want to say thank you, give us your Twitter handle, tell people where they can reach out and, and say hello. Yeah, I mean, you go to you go to HerganRotherIndustries.com and everything's connected. All our social media buttons, everything's right there, and we'd love to hear you connect. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Hey, bud. Uh, let's uh, let's let's catch up soon. Sure. Sounds great. See Thank you. you. Let's go.